Madam Chair, this is uh, this is Ryan from LSO, and I'll be running the Zoom today. So I do have um, uh, Director uh, of the Wyoming Game and Fish coming in the room for you. Perfect. And I believe we'll have um, an update from our Department of Ag, um, Environmental Quality, State Parks, the Wyoming Energy Authority, Homeland Security, talk about our fisheries, and also have the state engineer with us. So um, we'll just get through um, committee members. I think we'll keep this pretty informal. If you have a question, please just raise your hand and get my attention. And we'll, um, if that's okay with all the directors, we'll just ask questions as we go. But I think um, Director Nesvik, thank you for being here. As you know, we um, both uh, the Senate and House yesterday considered potential amendments on funding and funding sources. And those were defeated, but we do wanna understand some questions that came up I know on the Senate were, how are you addressing issues now? What are some budget potential implications so um, just feel free to give us as much information that can help us make good decisions going forward. But thank you, Director Nesvik. Good morning, Madam Chair. Are you able to hear me? Yes. All right, well, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. First of all, I, I applaud you for taking um, the time to provide this opportunity to get some information out on, on a discovery that occurred about a week ago today that uh, we certainly are very concerned about in the Game and Fish Department and so are um, other state agencies as well. Um, I'll, I'll just provide a little bit of intro here. I've got on my end, um, I've got our Chief of Fisheries for the Game and Fish Department, Alan Osterland with me. And as you mentioned, we've got several other state directors. I know Director Miyamoto, um, who has been working very closely with us on this issue is, is on the line and he will, um, he'll, he'll probably be the next after I finish here to provide some some thoughts from his perspective. Um, just a little bit of background, you know, what is a zebra mussel? So it's a, it's a very small mussel that is native to um, Southern Ukraine and the Caspian Sea. It has found its way into the United States um, over a decade ago and has um, caused all kinds of wreak and, and havoc on many of the states to our east and our south. We've worked for many, many years now, over a decade in Wyoming to prevent these um, zebra and quagga mussels. Uh, today we'll talk about zebra mussels, quagga mussels are similar. We've been working for over a decade to prevent these mussels from entering our state because of the catastrophic impacts that could occur um, if they were to come to Wyoming. Wyoming remains um, until this point, uh, zebra and quagga mussel free. The, the, what these little critters are, um, to use the, the chairwoman's words are, uh, it's a small muscle and, and when they're in their adult form, you can actually see them about the size of a thumbnail. And when they're in their juvenile form, you can't see them, they're invisible, they're, they're, they're so small, they're microscopic and you, and you can't see them. And those are the larval forms. We've worked hard to prevent both the larval and the adult form from entering our state by using um, check stations across the state to inspect boats that are coming into our state and then uh, a pretty wide information and education effort to promote clean, drain, and dry. These mussels cannot survive when they're not in the, in the water. The, uh, the reason for this most recent concern is, um, like I said, about a week ago, we learned that there were several pet shops across Wyoming. Now we've learned in five locations, Sheridan, Gillette, Casper, Rock Springs, and Cheyenne, all Petco or PetSmart stores that had a product that they sold that they sell called a moss ball. Um, and we'd learned that these zebra mussels, and now we believe viable zebra mussels, came to the came into Wyoming um, in this moss ball. A moss ball is an aquarium product that people purchase to um, put in their aquariums for um, to it's it's supposed to add uh, or supposed to help clean tanks and provide um, benefits to fish that are in the tank. Anyway, these these um, zebra mussels, we believe, were inside of these moss balls. Um, when they ship them from overseas and import them, they're, they dry them out to a certain extent, but not completely. And so um, when we discovered these, these mussels across the state, we immediately began uh, becoming concerned about how long they'd been here and um, you know, how they could potentially get into either our live water systems or into municipal water systems or the sewer systems, basically. Director Nesbitt. Yes, ma'am. May I interrupt you for a second? 
Um, one question I, I've been asked and I, I want to know as well is, are you able to, when you go to those pet shops, look at um, sales records, credit card receipts, those kinds of things to identify who purchased, who potentially purchased those moss balls and, and reach out to folks who have them in their homes? Madam Chair, that's a, a great question. And we have, we don't have um, access to that information. However, Petco has been, at least in some of the stores, um, doing that work to try to reach out to their known customers. Some are known, some are not. Depends on how they paid and how they um, obtained the, the moss ball when they purchased it. Um, kind of along those lines, all of the Petco stores in Wyoming have pulled this product off their shelf. And um, we have collected multiple samples um, from all of those stores in the state too. So we can do our own, our own testing and sampling. Um, uh, Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, how did you discover these? Um, what, how did this come about that you knew that they were here? Director Nesvik. Madam Chair, Representative Newsom. So um, a, a, an employee in another state um, saw the muscle in, I believe is in Washington state and um, started notifying other agencies when we, when we heard about what had happened in Washington state, that's when we went out to our stores, like I said, about a week ago and found them in our stores. The other thing I'd add to that is, is now there's well over 30 states that have found these products with viable zebra mussels in their state. Please continue. So the, the other things I'll add here before I turn it over to talking about what the potential impacts are to multiple um, different sets of infrastructure in the state are that We've learned that 90% of these, we believe, have come from um, one importation point in California, and um, and so that's that's a good thing because you know they're not coming in through multiple um, different points of importation. The other 10%, we believe, and this is information from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, have come in through the states of New Jersey. And New York. Our focus at this point, though, we believe that most of or all of, of the product that have arrived in Wyoming came through this importation spot in California. The, the threats, and I guess before I talk about the actions we've taken to this point, I think it's important to understand from um, other agencies what the potential impacts are to their area of responsibility. Um, the other thing, too, that I I think is important to note is, is this product is very widely disseminated and it's widely used. Um, it, it, you can order it on Amazon, Walmart, Etsy, eBay, all the online large scale commercial platforms. And we, I'll talk here in a little bit about what we've done to try to, to, try to thwart that. Um, but I think this would be a good point to, I'll, I'll talk here in a little bit about impacts to water systems from a fisheries and a biology perspective, but I think it would be good maybe to start with Director Miyamoto and ask him to talk about agricultural irrigation systems and other concerns that he has from his perspective. That sounds great. If you're not already in, please turn on your camera and your microphone and identify yourself. Committee members, you should have received a copy of the quarantine order that the department issued this week. And so welcome Director Miyamoto. Thank you, Chairwoman Ellis. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning, members of the committee. I'm Doug Miyamoto with the Department of Agriculture. And, you know, I think Director Nesvik gave you a, a good background and, and uh, idea of the scope of concern that is uh, obvious for game and fish departments around the United States. But I think one of the most impacted sectors is likely agriculture. There's a couple of analogies that I typically use when thinking about these zebra mussels and those of you in the room that are familiar with agricultural practices, and I know that there are several of you that, that are. Um, I think of zebra mussels as the cheatgrass of the aquatic system. And then in terms of irrigation infrastructure, I think of zebra mussels as a really bad cholesterol problem for just about any, any kind of uh, underground pipes, intake systems, uh, check dams, diversion structures, anything with any moving parts in contact with uh, live water are certainly at risk. And, you know, we, we have been through 
recent infrastructure breakdowns in our irrigation system in the recent past, if you think about the tunnel collapse in the in the Torrington area last year and the impact that that had on the corn crop right at the worst time of the season to have it happen and how widespread that impact was and how hard people had to scramble to try to make that system workable. I think the scale of this type of problem is, is also easy to imagine. You know, the, the water comes in in such a form that you wouldn't know, but that they're there. And then if, if you're like many agriculturalists across Wyoming, you've spent the last 20 years trying to increase the efficiency of your irrigation systems, which means that a lot of people have gone from open ditches and earthen dams to at least gated pipes. A lot of time buried pipes, means of conveyance have all been changed to try to increase efficiency. We've had a lot of center pivots that have gone in around the state to try to increase irrigation efficiencies. And all of that was done in the best of intentions, but I think those are the structures that are probably most at risk from this muscle infestation. They're much harder to clean out than our old style uh, berms that, that we had at, at one time. At least it could be managed in that setting, I believe, to a to a higher degree. But there are other states that have been dealing with zebra mussels as dressed Director Nesvik indicated for many years, and uh, it's just cost so much money to try to get in front of this. And, and water is so important to our agricultural backbone here in Wyoming. I mean, it's just vital that that we're able to continue to to irrigate. Without that, it is a it's not a it's not a pretty picture for ag in Wyoming. And so, we want to do everything that we can think of to try to stem the the spread of these muscles beyond where they were detected. I never would have guessed that this would have been the pathway for zebra mussels into Wyoming. And we can talk a little bit about, you know, the quarantine order that we put in place and, and the strategy that the Department of Ag has collaborated with uh, the Game and Fish and with the governor's office and with our, with our other sister agencies to try to, uh, do everything that we can think of to stop the, the spread of the, of the mussels out of those pet stores and out of the aquariums that have, that have already been exposed. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I'm available to try to answer any questions that anybody may have just on irrigation generally, I suppose. Thank you, Director Miyamoto. Uh, Co-Chair Flitner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Director Miyamoto, I'm looking at uh, the co-chairman's laptop and she's on Amazon's page right now and you can buy one of these uh, moss balls presently. And so from a federal standpoint, why are these not being pulled from these online sites? Do you know, can you speak to the, your federal partners and see or what have they been doing at their level to try to mitigate this? Director. What I, uh, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Chairwoman Flitner, I, um, I can tell you that we have made contact with Amazon and have sent the quarantine order to them. And um, I know that we've also been in contact with our federal partners at USDA APHIS uh, Plant Protection Inspection Service and have informed them of the quarantine order. And I think there's a lot of moving pieces right now on the, on the national scale but uh, I'm hoping that that message is delivered very soon to, to stop sale on, on those products. Follow-up questions? Oh, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and Director, thanks for being here. I, I guess uh, the question I have is what, if anything, have you been able to do or felt like you needed to do uh, with respect to mitigation up to this point? Um, as you may or may not know, I've always been a little bit lukewarm on efforts simply because it all fell on the sportsmen and through the game and fish department. And the entire rest of our spectrum uh, has been able to just rely on our game and fish personnel to, to try to keep these out of the state. So uh, I'm just curious, um, are we just getting started on the other fronts or, or have we been up to some things that I'm not aware of? Director Miyamoto. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, I think that um, 
There have been a lot of efforts, particularly uh, specifically on the weed and pest side of the side of the equation uh, with the agriculture sector and a lot of uh, programs that that lead directly and indirectly to spread of invasive species generally, but some of them are specifically targeted at zebra mussels and then a close associate of theirs known as quagga mussels that uh, that we've taken on. One of them is uh, called Clean Play Go or Play Clean Go, sorry. And then the the other the other one is a is a program that uh, is. It's a principle of early detection and rapid response where, you know, the, that's the stage that we're in right now is this rapid response. But there have been numerous uh, education efforts and all of our weed and pest districts are certainly well aware of, of this pest as well. And I believe on the, on the, on the queue today, I've got uh, Wyoming Weed and Pest Coordinator Slade Franklin is, is also on this morning. And so, uh, if you have specific questions about the efforts from that side of the equation, he's uh, he's on. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director. I appreciate that. Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director. And this this could go either either director, but do we know how long we've been selling these moss balls in the state of Wyoming? I'll let you two decide who to respond. Madam Chair, I think I can take that from, from what I know now anyway. Madam Chair, um, Representative Haroldson, so, you know, we know that for at least the last couple of months, but some of the indications we've gotten over the last, through our investigation, is that these might have been sold in Wyoming for up to a year or even longer now. We're trying to put a, a pin on that to figure out exactly how long through interviews with employees and, and through an investigation that we're conducting. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, we have, uh, I have reached out to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and I have asked them to um, contact directly um, at a national level, Amazon and those other online platforms to stop uh, any kind of continued sale of those products. And obviously, as you've seen this morning, they haven't been able to achieve that yet. And uh, I haven't received an update in a couple of days on where they're at. I did um, they did confirm with me that they have reached out, though. Any follow-up questions, Representative Haroldson? Thank you, Madam Chairman. It, just as a follow-up, I just want to say, uh, Director Nesvik, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I know you probably haven't slept a lot in the last uh, in the last week, but thank you for what you've done and what you are doing for protecting the state from these, and, and we'll definitely partner in any way we can. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, briefly, Director Nesvik or Miyamoto, have you reached out to the congressional delegation? Madam Chair, I have not. I don't know that uh, the governor's office hasn't, though, and I think Joe Budd may be on and maybe I'll answer that question. Thank you. Well, Madam Chairwoman, we, we at WDA have and have sent the, the quarantine order along and have been in contact. Uh, that just happened yesterday for us. Great. Thank you. Um, to just keep this moving, I know we've got Director Westby from State Parks. Um, how about we hear, have some remarks from him? Good morning, Director. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Chairwoman Ellis, uh, Committee, Darren Westby, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. Thanks for your time. and. Uh, thanks uh, to Doug and our Director Miyamoto and uh, Director Nesvik for setting this up with you and allowing me to speak at least on the impact of what is happening with our with our agency. And uh, just quickly, uh, our visitation for our entire system is a little over four million annually. Visitation at our water centric parks is a little over three million annually. Uh, Looking at our percentages that have some of the reports that we've seen uh, surrounding us, they, they're saying that they're, they're worried about a 10% reduction in visitation if this gets into their system. So that would put us around 300,000 less visitors in our system. However, that's not really accurate because if this uh, muscle system gets into our uh, treatment system at Hot Springs State Park, that, that would be almost 100% loss uh, of visitation there at Hot Springs. Um, so that would take us to about a 1.6 million uh, visitor less than we have in, in average years. And so 
obviously we have a revenue hit, which is uh, since we don't charge at Hot Springs State Park, uh, our revenue, just direct revenue would be about $125,000 a year. However, I think uh, as you're probably well aware, our economic impact is what is overly concerning to us. And if this was to hit our system, uh, we're looking at about a $30 million a year economic impact to the local and state economies. Uh, we've also been in contact with the area managers uh, for the Bureau of Reclamation, Carly Ronka out of the Mills office and Joe Hall out of the Rapid City office. Uh, their, their continued concerns uh, probably are no different uh, today as they were yesterday or last year. That, that if this gets into their system, their dam mechanics uh, continue to uh, be concerned. Their hydroelectric generation plants are highly in concern. Um, so their, their eyes are on it. They're definitely partners uh, with us on trying to ensure that uh, these stay out of our system. Uh, then, then I go into the impact on the boaters themselves. We have um, reports that show that uh, just a boat owner themselves, anywhere from 200 to $400 per year per boat for any extra maintenance because of these muscles getting into their systems. We have uh, and Director Nesbitt can correct me, but I think we have about, well, a little over close to 26,000 boats uh, registered in Wyoming. And that's anywhere from two to $400 per boat. That's about five to $10 million in ad additional expenses to just private boat owners throughout this. And then if you look at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the, the value added um, report for Wyoming for boating fishing activities show that it, um, this industry spends well over $43 million per year in Wyoming. And similar to other state reports that we've seen, if we take this down, what they're showing is 4%. That's, that's a $1.7 million per year in spend that uh, would potentially happen. Uh, it's definitely the top five outdoor recreation activity in Wyoming. Um, and then if you tackle in um, the amusement water park activities like we have there at Hot Springs State Park, that uh, BEA analysis is five million per year. And so uh, obviously we, we are very uh, interested in keeping these things out of our system. We've been working with the Game and Fish Department for uh, well over a decade now. We helped uh, with them develop the AIS program uh, to try to keep uh, these muscles out. And, as Director Miyamoto said, it, it's a different vector that we were expecting, but uh, I, I applaud uh, Doug and Brian's efforts to um, ramp up and just spin up so fast with this uh, new vector coming in. So, and we continue to work very hard with, uh, uh, with our staff, with their staff to uh, develop signage. I know we already have signs being posted uh, across various points within all of our system to try to just try to make people aware that um, don't dump your fish in our ponds. Don't dump your fish where uh, they don't need to go. Don't don't empty your tanks where it's uh, not appropriate and until we can get this resolved. And so with that, uh, Chairwoman Ellis, I, I would stand for any questions you or your committee may have. Thank you, um, Director Westy. Any questions? Uh, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Director Westby, thanks for being here. I appreciate the, your partnership with the Game of Fish and, and all that you do out there. I, I'm the proud owner of a brand new camper. Uh, so we're all excited to come and visit uh, you and Director Nesvik's uh, lands out there across the, the state. But it, my, my question comes to that. Um, do we have any mitigation technique in mind or um, could water that is in those RVs that come and visit our state, um, could, could that be a potential source? I never really even thought about it and, until today, but um, if, if that's the case, how would you even, um, you know, how would you even check an RV? Uh, Director. Ellis, uh, Senator, thank you. Uh, I that's a good question. I, I would think that most of those RVs are relatively self-contained. If not, they're dumping into an existing um, either sewer system or a dump system. And 
those are self-contained as well and uh, should not be reaching any live waters. And so I've, I'm not nearly as concerned about that as the, obviously the boats live water. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would, if there's anybody else that has any other ideas of how that could um, get into our waterways, I know we do have some people that, that like to open their tanks and drive down the interstate illegally. Um, but I would say that hopefully the, those, uh, those effluent would dry before it hits a live water. So I'm, I'm not nearly as concerned about RVs as we are boats for sure. Follow up. Thank you, director. Appreciate it. Okay. Additional Madam questions. Madam Chairwoman, love to have him and his RV at our state park. So don't, don't be concerned about that. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm wondering, is there any other way to kill them besides drying them out? Is there any other thing that can be done in our waters? That's for anybody. Thank you. Madam Chair, I think I can take that one. Director Nesvik. So Madam Chair, Representative Newsom. So currently we have a decontamination system that will decontaminate a boat and it, and it uses a combination of a, of a chemical solution along with heat, um, high temp water and that will um, kill these muscles. The other thing that we're um, in the process of investigating now is the potential, we, we believe UV light will kill um, these muscles. And we do know that um, at, at many of the water treatment facilities in the state, they do use um, UV light. We haven't quantified in it. And uh, Director Parfit may be on it, he might be able to help me with this, but I don't know that we've quantified how many water treatment facilities actually use UV light. Um, and so that's, that's one of the actions we're taking now is to try to do an inventory of what all we've got and where we're using different treatment systems to try to take care of it. Once it's in the, to follow up though on that, once it's in live water, there's no, um, there's no proven way to eradicate it from a reservoir or a river or, or a stream. Additional questions, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Director Neswick, just to follow up on that piece, I can remember the old days of, of shocking the Platte River, for example. Um, but let's just say that these would get into a place like Glendo or Alcova. Um, is it, there just simply isn't a way to flush those waterways? Uh, uh, I think I heard you say there's just really no way to get rid of them once they get there. Director Neswick. Madam Chair, Senator Landon, no, to our knowledge, um, there is no way once they're there to eradicate them. Now, there may be some ways to contain them. And that's really what our, as we've developed, you know, worst case scenarios, we, we call them rapid response plans. We've developed 23 of those. We're in the process now of finalizing those. You know, our, our strategy there has been containment because we don't have a way to eradicate. And the you know, other states have been grappling with this for quite some time. So there's been a lot of research, particularly in the Great Lakes, we're trying to find ways to do this and, and they haven't been able to find a way yet. Co-Chairwoman Flitner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Director Nesvik, is there a known predator that would you know, eat these mussels and do they act like a parasite, will they attach themselves to a, an, a, a fish that we might have in our water system? Director? Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, so the, uh, the way that they create um, damage and the way that they create problems with infrastructure is when they're in their adult form, they encrust to infrastructure. So that may be a boat dock, it may be a boat motor, it might be um, flooded structures. We've seen that before, flooded um, outhouses, as an example, they encrust themselves and they just continue to reproduce and and build that encrustment. It's like Director Miyamoto talked with the clogged artery. It just continues to clog arteries. And so they don't necessarily attach to fish, but they do to any kind of infrastructure. As far as um, predators, the only thing that I'm aware of is, is that I know that quagua mussels can sometimes um, cover up zebra mussels and and kill zebra mussels that way, but they're, you know, you still have the same problem. Quagua mussels are equally as destructive. Um, these things can, one female zebra mussel can have um, 1 million offspring per year. Great. 
<laughs> Additional questions from the committee? All righty, directors, thank you. Um, how about we hear next from uh, the Wyoming Energy Authority, if someone's on the line. And then after that, um, if there's uh, further comments from our fisheries dress, director Nesbic, that would be good too. I'm just kind of going through the list of um, agencies that you provided me with yesterday. Madam Chair, this is Ryan. Apologies for the interruption. Uh, who were you looking for again? Oh, they just, looks like they just raised their hand. I'll bring them in. Okay, perfect, thank you. And uh, Director Nesbik, just so you're aware, um, I actually have a contact at Walmart who reached out last year during the pandemic talking about their safety plans and what they're doing to keep consumers safe. I found her email, so I'm trying to put something together for you and um, Mr. Bud from the governor's office to see if she can provide some assistance. Thank you, Madam Chair. But, and then I, I apologize, sir, I can't see your name. Can you identify yourself for the committee members? Yeah, Chairwoman Alice, thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn Morrell. I'm the Executive Director at the Energy Authority. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today about this issue. I have a few observations to make about the potential impacts regarding this infestation with uh, respect to power generation. Although, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I'd ask that the committee uh, respects and understands that there are a lot of caveats associated with all the numbers I'm about to share. Uh, please do not um, treat them as anything more than a order of magnitude estimate of what we've seen elsewhere in the country and what that might uh, mean for, for Wyoming power generation. So Madam Chairwoman, the, the, the zebra mussel infestation has occurred in many places outside of Wyoming and there is a fair amount, a reasonable degree of uh, prior knowledge or prior practice that we can look to to understand how it would impact the power generation sector. There are generally two approaches that uh, are followed um, in generalized methods. Uh, one is to treat the pipes themselves, so which is very much a manual sort of physical scrape the pipes issue, uh, particularly at the intakes. Um, and that can run uh, starting approximately about uh, half a million dollars of cost per year at a typical facility, thermal generation facility on the West Coast or in the Southeast. The other aspect or potential mitigation is that you can treat the water on the intake. And those systems started about a million dollars for CapEx and associated with $100,000 a year in terms of OPEX. Again, uh, very, very rough order numbers. Uh, they scale can incredibly. If you look at large hydro, you're starting to get into the tens of millions of dollars in terms of a treatment uh, option on those facilities. So it's, it's a, it, there's a lot of variation, but obviously there's a large cost. Now, the, the good thing is, there's always a silver lining. The good thing is that the, the fouling typically only occurs at the major intakes because those systems are um, required to have high quality water once they're inside the thermal generation system. So they're generally associated with a lot of filtration uh, at the front end so that there cannot be um, scaling and precipitation and biogenic fouling inside the generation system itself. So all these treatment systems typically occur around the intakes of the system. Okay. Um, in Wyoming, that's even, uh, there's even better news because we do, the, the thermal generation uh, options in, in Wyoming are typically quite contained. They have, because of the general scarcity of water in Wyoming, in contrast to systems in Southeast or the West Coast, where there's a lot of evaporative cooling and recycling of water. So the intakes themselves are smaller, but you're still looking at uh, something in the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars on an annual basis to, to mitigate the impacts of these, um, these little critters on the, on the power generation systems themselves. If it were to actually get past the filtration system, and infiltrate the entire generation um, system itself, that would clearly be catastrophic. But, but there are ways and means to prevent that happening. And so it is quite an unlikely occurrence. The, the interesting aspect uh, in a negative context is the potential impact on a, on a nascent hydrogen generation system, particularly green hydrogen, where hydrogen is generated uh, through renewable sources uh, and electrolyzation of water uh, they use a, a significant amount of water in those systems and it has to be high quality water. 
for the same reason. And running through anything, any water, any sort of briny water through an electrolyzer has scale and precipitation issues. So it has to be very clean uh, and, and clear of any sort of fouling. So there is a very real potential impact to and a very unknown impact, unfortunately, with respect to what this uh, could mean for a nascent hydrogen generation um, sector within the, the energy economy of Wyoming. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, that concludes my remarks and I stand ready for questions. Uh, thank you. Questions? Yep. Chairwoman Flitner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Morrell, can you just tell us what it's cost? I'm sure you've probably in your analysis, uh, just the state of Michigan alone, because wasn't that sort of ground zero with these zebras, mussels? Uh Chairwoman Flitter, thank you. Chairwoman Alice, thank you for your question. The it is there are a lot of yeah, there's a lot of history in different places, and we have simply have not had the time yet to dive into those um, the scale of those issues. Uh, I've been reading one recently from the West Coast, Washington State. It's also significant impact recently, um, and there in a big broad large number, they were talking about five to eight billion dollars a year uh, impact across the entire economy, not not simply generation itself. Um, so those numbers are there, um, but I'm, I'm sorry to report we haven't had not had the time to dive in and uh, do any sort of um, detailed analysis and also to translate that to what it means to to Wyoming. Thank you. Any questions, further questions from committee members? Thank you for being with us, Mr. Morrell. Um, moving on, uh, Director Nesvik, I don't know, we have um, on the agenda you provided or suggested you had a, perhaps getting an update from the fellow who works on your fisheries. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just was gonna update the committee on the impact on, on fisheries if zebra mussels or quagga mussels were to become established in a body of water. And, and quite simply, um, you know, small organisms in the water called zoo and, and phytoplankton are kind of the bottom of the food chain. And so they're, you know, they're critical for the survival of native and, and game fish. Some game fish and native fish directly eat those phyto and zooplankton. And then some of them feed on um, smaller bait fish that, that feed on phyto or zooplankton. Zebra mussels um, take those nutrients out of the water but then they are not a viable part of the food chain. So they disrupt the food chain at the very lowest level. And the, the consequence of that is, is that um, you have a decrease in the, in the fish population. That's what's been observed in other bodies of water, like Powell is a good example. You know, the water becomes very clear. Um, you know, you can see in, in deep water, you can see the bottom, but that's not good from a fisheries perspective because those fish rely on those native Zo and phytoplankton and even native, native mussels. There are native mussels in our waters, um, but, but those aren't harmful. They're part of the food chain. Um, the other thing that is another consequence is that as these mussels die, they wash up on beaches and there are beaches in, in our country that are, you, you can't walk on with bare feet because they're covered in, in these shells from these, um, these zebra and quagga mussels. That's, that's really it on a, from a fisheries perspective, Madam Chair. Questions for Director Nesvik, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Nesvik, um, my curiosity, we've been dealing with the budget the last two or three days, as you know. Um, I guess my question is, um, do you have the resources you need if, if we end up with a major discovery? Do you have the resources you need to go in there and, uh, and mitigate the disaster? Director Nesvik. Madam Chair, Senator Landon, uh, no, we do not. And I, I strongly believe that, um, you know, we continue to run and we have run the program and paid for the program since its inception um, with a caveat, and I'll share that in just a second. But the bottom line is, is if we have to respond in a body of water and implement our rapid response plans, the cost of that could be, you know, 500000 to several million dollars to try to um, contain uh, zebra mussels to a specific body of water. And those are um, those numbers are derived from some pretty thorough analysis from our, our professionals in our, in our fish division. Um, I have talked with several members of the committee about, you know, before any of this came up about creating an emergency type of an account that we wouldn't necessarily need appropriated to the game and fish, but something that 
we could rely on with some predictability to be available to the governor um, in the event that we had to respond to you know, something larger scale. As far as what we're dealing with today, um, we believe that you know, the initial costs of doing some much enhanced testing, as well as some significant education efforts um, in the interest of protecting all of Wyoming's infrastructure, not just fisheries or watercraft, but municipal water, hydroelectric power production, um, irrig irrigation, those kind of things, you know, just the initial estimates we have there to deal with this today outside of our normal operating budget is somewhere around 100,000 and it could be more than that. We don't know right now. I can tell you that one eDNA test, which give, you can take a sample of water and send it to a lab and I believe it's in Montana and they can conduct it, take that water and try to find DNA from these mussels. Just one of those tests costs $1,200, it's, they're not cheap. And we are intending to do some significant sampling across the state um, to see where we may have these things. Um, I feel like that's our most important next step. As far as our current operating budget, when the legislature directed the department to um, begin this program about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, they appropriated money and also authorized the department to sell a sticker to voters um, that would help pay for the program. In the early parts of that, the, the sticker paid for part of it. There were some small federal grants that paid for part of the annual costs. And then um, the general fund paid the balance, basically. There was still some um, sportsman dollars that were required to, to fill the gap. But essentially, it's been a $1 to $1.3 million annual cost to just run our program now to prevent, um, really focused on watercraft. Um, when the legislature took um, and removed all general fund appropriations from the department about four years ago, um, that, that money went away. And so now the department, through um, the sale of the stickers, which is about 700,000 a year, and some federal grants um, that, that vary, right now they're, they're, um, they're a little bit more than they were before. Um, between those two sources, it still doesn't pay for the whole program. And we um, use other funds, non-watercraft funds, basically, to fill that gap to pay for the annual costs right now. Senator. Senator. Chairman, uh, Director Nesvig, thank you for that. I've, I've often wondered, um, being a sportsman of myself and being out around those lakes a lot, um, we just can't convince some of our game and fish personnel to work 24 hours a day. Um, so I've, it, I've just felt all along that we've been very lucky. Um, I try to stop every time I can, you know, to visit with our guys and gals that are out there working it. it but honestly, we, we've got boats arriving at 10 o'clock at night. So it, it, it just has felt all along that, um, that we really needed to be investing more. And uh, so I appreciate, uh, thank you for running that down for us. Madam Chair, if I may, um, just to follow up. Um, the other thing I would say in line with um, some of Senator Landon's comments is, and I've relayed this to, to both of our chairwomen, is that, you know, the, these impacts are, are broad and um, really impact anybody who relies on water in our state, which is all of our citizens. And I, I feel strongly that the cost for that should be borne by, you know, the, a broader base and not just on the backs of sportsmen or watercraft users. And I just ask the committee to consider those things as you um, grapple with some difficult decisions and, and difficult discussions you have with your, um, with all of your fellow legislators. Further questions, Representative, or excuse me, Senator Schuler, and then we'll go to Representative Haroldson and Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question. We, we do a lot of voting in uh, my family and of course, we're down on the southwest corner of the state, so we do uh, venture out of state occasionally. And uh, I just wondered, um, I know the checkpoints seem like they're doing a great job, uh, but I wondered about, like, for instance, Utah or Colorado or some of the states around us, if they've had a, uh, an outbreak or an infestation that you're aware of. Thank you. Director Nesvik. Madam Chair, Senator Schuler, yes, they have. And um, Utah certainly has their share of problems with uh, mussels. They've, I, they've got Lake Powell is infested with them. And of course, most of Lake Powell is in Utah. Colorado has had some smaller 
bodies of water that have been infested and they've been um, dealing with this here, here recently as well. Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, how long from, sorry, Director Nesvik, how long from like this point where we obviously have a potential, uh, a potential issue, how long until we start seeing adult, um, adult muscles? Do we have an idea on what this, this period of time is? Uh, and then before that is answered, I also want to just throw out, um, we talk about hydroelectric as the issue. Every coal fire power plant in this state obviously is run by steam. Steam needs to be condensed, which means we have a cooling system. So uh, as, as we were listening to that, I was going through my, my last life of, of a mechanic in a coal fire power plant. And we've got six, six and a half, seven miles of piping going from the, the body of water that, that LRS ran off of. So it's just, yeah, I mean, we need a, the, the economic impact is, astronomical. I'm just trying to think, I'm just as a mechanic trying to think how you would clean out six miles of 24 inch pipe. Yeah. And I'm not that small. So, um, <laughs> so it's just, it's a thing that I, I think that, yeah. So that the question of how long from larva to, uh, an actual adult. And then, um, yeah, I just want everyone to realize that hydro, yeah, would be absolutely impacted, but every generational facility in this state, um, would be impacted. Director Nesvik. Madam Chair, Representative Haroldson, I, I don't know how long it takes from the larval stage to the adult stage, but you know, I would tell you that their life cycle is such that it's, it's certainly not many, many years. It's a shorter period of time than that. Um, the other thing I would say to that is in one of the more difficult um, and complex components of this problem we're dealing with is, uh, you know, it's a good thing we've never had them in Wyoming. However, because of that, we don't know how they would behave in Wyoming. We don't know how they would reproduce in our water. We don't know if there's something, you know, there's a chance that because of something we're not aware of, pH of the water, elevation, um, something like that, that they couldn't be viable in Wyoming. However, you know, I feel like we're at a point in this situation where we have to assume the worst case when we have unknowns and we have to plan and prevent and do our level best to not even get to the point we were, where we learn if they can survive in our live bodies of water. Follow up, uh, Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director. So I'm reading here within two to three weeks, uh, the larvae begin to settle out in the water under the weight of their own forming shells and attach to firm underwater surfaces. Once attached, it'll take approximately one year for the muscle uh, to grow to a one inch in length and become sexually mature. And the lifespan of a zebra muscle is two to five years. Thank you. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'd like to circle back to the funding of this um, endeavor and the stickers that you mentioned, where are they sold? Director. Madam Chair, Representative Newsom. So both motorized and non-motorized watercraft that use our waters in Wyoming have to purchase those stickers for their boat. Um, they're different prices depending on whether it's motorized, non-motorized, and whether you're a resident or a non-resident. And they're sold at our game and fish offices and all of our licensed selling agents. Um, follow up, Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I'm wondering, so it's similar to a conservation stamp. Is that... Kind of Madam Chair, Representative Newsom, yes. Madam Chairman, um, would it be viable to expand the sale of those in pet stores and in sporting goods stores and from, uh, I don't vote, so I would have no opportunity to contribute to this effort, but I think there are a lot of people that would want to contribute. So I'm wondering if that's ever been thought of or if we should go forward with something like that to allow um, non-boating users to contribute to this effort. Director Nesvik. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Newsom, um, to this point, the focus of, those, of the sale of those stickers has been specifically to um, create a venue for watercraft users to help pay for the, the program that we currently have in place. Um, in order to expand that to make it so that people could either voluntarily purchase them 
or to require them for other uses. Either way would require some statutory changes for sure, but it would be something that if it was this committee and the, and the full body's pleasure could be implemented. Uh, Chairwoman Flitner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director Nesvik, if Lake Powell has an infestation, uh, have we ever thought about preventing any of those boats from ever launching in our state? Director Madam, Nesvik. Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, um, no, we have not taken uh, or explored any kind of a, uh, I guess a, a strong-handed approach like that. We have treated basically any boat that enters our state from Lake Powell as a high-risk boat. And we go, you know, we go through those things from uh, very, very thoroughly. And if there's any suspicion at all that they may have live water, uh, they get decontaminated. But to this point, that's been our, our approach. We haven't prevented, um, and, and this again would require some statutory changes. Um, we haven't prevented boats from entering the state. Um, we've just decontaminated them if we're concerned. Any other questions from committee members? Um, looking at my list of people who might be participating, we have not heard from Joe Bud from the governor's office. Um, before we move to him though, I, I'm just trying to catch up on last minute research kind of in the moment. What are the current efforts nationally to maybe have these moss balls uh, recalled? So Madam Chair, the, there's currently um, a couple of things going on. So at the federal level, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we, we immediately engaged with them um, a week ago. And they have a, you know, they have a responsibility to inspect animals, any kind of animal that comes into the country. Um, and then USDA has a responsibility for plants. Um, because of those responsibilities, and then also because of the, there's, you know, there's federal law that prohibits anything illegally imported into the United States, and a zebra mussel is one of those organisms, from being moved from state to state under the Lacey Act. So there is an active um, criminal investigation, both at the state level and the federal level. And the, um, you know, they, the, the federal government, either USDA or um, the Fish and Wildlife Service have the authority or at least, um, have the ability to try to prevent and, and stop this at a national level. I think we've done as a state what we can do. Um, Director Miyamoto's quick actions there have, have done what we can do as a state, but I think it's, we, we've, they know that this is a really big deal for us. Some states are not taking this seriously because frankly, they've got plenty of zebra mussels already. And so they're just not, they're not as concerned, but the Fish and Wildlife Service to this point has been very good. They put Last weekend, they had what they told me is they had all their agents in the country working on this case and um, doing collection, data collection, investigation across the entire country to try to help figure out how to stop this, you know, right now. Uh, thank you, Director. And one last question. Do you have any thoughts of how you would make, or even statutory authority, if you wanted to have a bounty on it, say a pet or a pet store uh, purchasers, if you, you bought one of these, we'll pay you to give, we'll pay you the cost of what it, you purchased it for to bring it back in just to have that kind of financial incentive. Do you have any thoughts of whether or not that might be effective or, and I'm guessing you would need some statutory authority for something like that? Yeah, Madam Chair, I think we would. Um, you know, we've got a lot of hope right now that people will, through our education effort, will understand how big a deal this is and that they will follow our guidelines for how to dispose of water from a fish tank that's had one of these moss balls in it or other similar products. We've also have a, a, a venue for folks who may have inadvertently unknowingly dumped a fish tank at some point that had a moss ball in it. We've given them a venue to report anonymously that they did it so that we can go to that location and try to sample it and see if it's infected any waters. Um, as far as an incentive to report, you know, I think that there's certainly some merit to anything we can do um, to incentivize people to do that. We are exploring our current statutory authority as well to see if we have the ability through regulation to prohibit um, dumping of fish tanks into water, into live water, um, 
anywhere in the state. I don't know that we have that statutory authority, but we do have some pretty good, when, when the legislature first grappled with this in 2010, um, they did give us some pretty good authority on preventing AIS from coming in on watercraft. So we're gonna give that a look and see what we may be able to do both on the regulatory side as well as on the education and the incentive side. Thank you, Director. And, and just committee members, this wasn't an issue that um, when Chairwoman Flitner and I both uh, assumed the gavel for this committee, we did talk about aquatic invasive species. We talked to Director Nesvik about potential interim topics that we wanted to maybe visit about. Um, but I do think we're going to need to revisit just the scope of that. You know, certainly as I'm sitting here, I am frustrated that I don't think we've got a good process or um, outline of how we reach out to online retailers and do automatic bans of that prohibit online sales and having those products entering our state. So it, the, the look will be much broader than I anticipated. I think we had all thought it would all be watercraft conversations and checkpoints and, and things of that nature, but it, it sounds like we've got a lot more thinking to do. Um, I did see that uh, Joe Budd from the governor's office just joined us on the Zoom. So uh, Mr. Budd, is there, what would you like to offer as far as remarks for the committee? Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, thanks for having me. I, I would just begin by um, extending a, a the, the governor asked me to, to share his appreciation for uh, you and Chairwoman Flitner's efforts on the floor and, and for others that uh, spoke to try and help with that footnote. So um, I guess what I would share if and, and I'd be happy to walk through the governor's emergency fund and where those footnotes were intended if the committee would like to, but I'm not sure that that is um, completely relevant right now. It, I, I would offer a, a couple other things that, that we're looking at in the governor's office in terms of potential impacts that are outside of um, maybe kind of what we've been talking about here today. And so if, if these do become established, we have other concerns with things like endangered species and some of the litigation and, and things that happen in our state. Uh, there are organizations out there that, that seek to list uh, really any kind of species they can. And the way that the Endangered Species Act works with invertebrates um, is much different than it does for, or I, I guess it's not that much different than it does for um, other species. And so Director Nesvik mentioned, you know, the, the phytoplankton and the trophic level impacts that this could have to our systems and whether that's for cutthroat trout or um, we have a, a stonefly that's listed as threatened right now in certain areas, uh, but we also have native mussels. Um, and, and so what does that mean for us if this was to happen and, and where does that put us in terms of footing for um, potential issues with the Endangered Species Act in, in the future? Um, you know, the, the indirect impacts to our municipalities and um, some of our less populated counties could be completely massive. So it, uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna work within what we have right now um, within that emergency fund uh, and, and we'll, I, I think there's plenty to discuss in the interim. Um, as Director Nesvik mentioned, there, there may be some kind of different contingency fund that needs to exist for, for things like this, but happy to work with this committee on, on anything you'd like to. And, and again, just thank you to uh, the chairwomen and the, and the other members of this committee that, that uh, spoke in favor the other day on the floor, which is much appreciated, so. Uh, thank you, Senator Landon. Thank you, Mr. Bud, for being here this morning. Appreciate your comments. Uh, you have the, uh, the flex authority, the B11 authority, and enough left in any reserves of any kind um, that would allow you to uh, respond in a hurry to uh, something that we might run across. Mr. Bud. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Landon, we, we do have some money left in that uh, emergency fund, um, but what we did with the step three cuts and what would happen in the 23-24 biennium would take that down to roughly half a million dollars. And, and that emergency fund is really for any emergency. It's, it's not specific to, you know, a, a biological emergency. It's not specific to flooding or anything like that. And, and there is a portion of that that um, hopefully can be used to match federal funds if they become available and things. So it, it's been used very sparingly and very cautiously for that reason, for, for um, large emergencies. And, and the intent, I believe, 
with the footnotes the other day was to have it specifically for zebra mussels and be a one-time deal. So it, we do, it, we also have the endangered species account in the governor's office. Um, it is, it's pretty well leveraged at this point. I, and we're going to go back and look in under every rock and see what we have. Um, but I, uh, we might be coming back at this next session and asking for something else. I, we just don't know yet. We don't know the extent of the impact. We don't know. Um, we may have to buy product from people, all those different things that have been mentioned today. Um, you know, and, and we really don't know how well they'll persist in our waters or if they will. Uh, but there was a study out of Idaho that suggested that they really like calcium, which is not a good thing for us. Um, so, <laughs> And, and really, if Lake Superior uh, can't kill them with cold, then I don't think we're going to get anything done there either. So a, a lot of unknowns right now, especially with term, in terms of how much it might cost. Uh, but we're really, really focused on the rapid response and not having to get into the conversations of millions or billions of dollars because um, nobody wants to go there. Questions from committee members? Uh, Mr. Bud, thank you for your remarks and uh, you know that you touched on another important topic that I know I wanted to look at and explore more in this interim coming up is just an update from the Attorney General's office and your office on um, current litigation involving ESA and just what's kind of out there and what we should be uh, paying attention to. So um, more to come on that this coming year. Um, the last you know, I think we're, we're kind of wrapping up committee members. Are there any lingering questions for any of the agency members? I think Representative Hurt has his hands up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. One thing for Director Nesvik, I'm just blowing through article upon article here. Uh, there was an article put out that uh, they're finding the freshwater drum to be a, a potential predator. Uh, I'll send it to you, I'll, I'll email it to you, but they're saying the freshwater drum is is known as being a a predator, and that they have found that it was that uh, the sheephead or the freshwater drum was found to have zebra mussels in their stomach, up to large amounts of them. Um, so I don't know. I know we have freshwater drum in our in our waterways, and so maybe that's a very a simple way we could maybe start working from a back door of throwing a ton of them in. Um, cause I know that they're a good bottom feeder and, and maybe we could lose some carp out of the deal. So anyways, just a thought that I found and I'll send that information over to your way. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. Madam chair, if I may respond to that. Yes, please. Madam chair, representative Haroldson. So yeah, great. I appreciate that, that information. And, um, that is one thing they tried in the, in the great lakes and, uh, what they found there anyway, and certainly we're in a different, different spot here. Cause we got, you know, a different ecosystem in our water systems. But in the Great Lakes, the, the freshwater drum were not able to keep up um, and they weren't able to really make an impact on mussels there anyway. But, but like I said, certainly could be something in Wyoming. Uh, my apologies. Um, I see that we have Luke Esch from the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, committee members, I have a, a printout of agenda items and I'll confess, um, I probably am due to start using some readers um, I haven't quite got there yet, so I, I apologize, Mr. Esch, that, that's my fault. So welcome, Department of Environmental Quality. Um, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for, for uh, letting me be here today. Uh, Director Parfit sends his regrets for being unable to be here. Um, he got uh, pulled into some other meetings. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to add that hasn't been said, um, but one aspect that I did want to comment on is the potential costs to the uh, municipal um, water users of the state. A good portion of our um, citizens use a por uh, at least a portion of surface water for their drinking water. And um, if uh, these mussels start to clog those intake valves from the surface water systems, um, that's going to add, add potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars to each of the municipal water users. Uh, there are the municipal programs around the state. Um, Director Nesvik did comment earlier on some of the wastewater systems do use UV uh, treatment systems. Um, we're currently compiling uh, an inventory of which, which facilities do have UV treatment and which ones don't. Um, and so we'll be working with, with the Game and Fish Department on providing that information. Um, we're also trying to prioritize uh, monitoring sites for, for these mussels. Um, given the, the known locations of these pet shops, I think downstream of some of the, these locations where these pet shops are at, um, 
that have surface water discharges might be some high priority monitoring sites for, for these. Um, and we're committed to working with, with Game and Fish on, on uh, doing whatever we can to, to get out there and monitor and certainly convey any information we see in the field. We have staff that are in the, that go out every year and, and do ambient water quality sampling in, in our surface waters around the state every year. And, um, you know, we can, we can incorporate visual monitoring in, into our sampling um, plans now. Um, and if, you know, if funding um, becomes available, we'll also uh, work towards incorporating the, uh, the analysis for the, the, for the genetic material of these, um, these muscles as well. Um, you know, our inspectors go out, uh, we're going to take a look, another look at our decontamination process for our, our gear. We already have that in place, but um, I guess it never hurts to, to take another look at it. And with that, um, I would stand for questions. Questions for Mr. Esch, Co-Chairwoman Flintner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Luke, thanks for being here this morning. And so with regard to the DNA test that the director had alluded to previously, so DE DEQ could roll that into, um, you would have the ability to do that, so we wouldn't have to outsource that. Madam Chair, um, Madam Chair Flitner, we, potentially we, we could, I mean, it, as Director Neswick indicated, it is a, is a fairly significant cost. Um, the current list of constituents we sample for whenever we go out um, are around three or $400 um, a, a sample. Um, adding this in, this additional genetic material testing on top, it sounds like it could cause um, significantly more. But um, you know, our, like I said, we have staff in the field that are doing these samples, and if if that is something that the department can do to to further the effort um, here, I think that is something that we can we can certainly consider. Follow up questions, oh, Chairwoman Flitter. Thank you, and Luke, just to follow up on that. So then. When you take your water samples, are you actually doing the testing in-house, that analysis, or do you outsource it? Does it go out of state? Madam Chair, um, I do not know the answer to that question, but I do believe that uh, Jennifer Zygmunt with our water quality division is on the Zoom today. Um, and she, if she could be admitted, she can probably give you a lot more detailed answers to that. Mr. Esch, is she waiting in the Zoom? Do you know? It is my understanding that she was going to be participating today. Alrighty, let's see if um, she raises her hand or turns on her camera or gets admitted. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is Ryan. Uh, could Mr. Esch repeat the name for me, please? Uh, yes, it's uh, Jennifer Zygmunt with a Z. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not seeing them in uh, them in the attendee list at this time. So if they could raise their hand if they are here, that would be helpful. And certainly Mr. Esch, if she's not available, um, just a follow-up response would be fine. We'll make sure the committee members get that. Madam Chair, absolutely. We can, we can follow up on that. Madam Chair, if I may. Director Nesvik. So we do, um, just wanted to alert the committee, we do have the director of our wildlife forensics and health lab um, that's a part of the game and fish department. Um, She's researching right now to see if we can conduct that test in-house. We haven't in the past, but she's doing some research. And if we were able to do it in-house, it would reduce the cost. That's, that's just one of the current ongoing actions. Madam Chair, this is Ryan and uh, uh, looks like um, Mr. Esch's colleague just joined us. Sounds good. And then LSO, just as a um, matter of curiosity, how many people do we have waiting or available that would like to speak. If we could just pull those members, raise your um, virtual hand so that we can get a, a sense. It is 916. And so, you know, this is an informational hearing. I, I do know members probably would like to get to their desk and um, prepare for the day, but certainly we want to give this attention. So I'm just trying to get a sense of how much more, um, how many more folks want to testify. Madam Chair, we have approximately 10 people in the in the waiting room. Um, we have one currently with their hand up and I will uh, admit them shortly. Sounds good. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Miss, I, I didn't catch your name. I didn't write it down. Can you say it for the record? Good morning. My name is Jennifer Zygmunt, Z-Y-G-M-U-N-T. Good morning. Oh, if you wanted to respond to Chairwoman Flintner's question. 
Yes, uh, to answer that question, some of the sample analysis for the water samples that our ambient crew collects is done in-house. Um, our water quality division lab has some of that capabilities. However, some of the constituents, we don't have the ability to sample in-house. So we do outsour outsource those to other laboratories. To do genetic testing, we do not have that capability within our water quality lab. Um, so that would have to be outsourced to another lab. Thank you, Ms. Zygmunt. Further questions? Seeing none. Mr. Esch, were there any other remarks that you wanted to offer? Madam Chair, no, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you again for being with us. And again, my apologies for skipping over you on the agenda. Please, uh, if Director Parfit was trying to participate in person and had to leave, um, please let him know. I'm sorry. Um, and then whoever else was admitted or had their hand up on the Zoom. Madam Chair, I'm admitting uh, uh, Director Bud from Homeland Security. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, Director Bud. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Committee. I just wanted to uh, uh, support, uh, let you know, we are in support of all of these agencies as we work with the protection and security of 16 different critical infrastructure sectors in the state, three of which are affected by this current situation, which is food and agriculture, um, energy, as well as water and wastewater. Um, all of the information that's presented, we, we had on our list as well, and um, know that we are here to support and um, do everything we can. I will mention, uh, we did some research with uh, the Public Service Commission, and um, as uh, Representative Haroldson mentioned, we do have 17 hydroelectric plants in the state, as well as all of the other electric generation plants that do need water to uh, function as well. So uh, just very, just a big foot stomp on all that's been mentioned today and to let you know that we are here to support as well. Um, any questions? Thank you, Director Bud. Questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you so much. Uh, director Nesvik, um, I think with that, we'll, we'll start closing this uh, informational hearing down. Are there any concluding remarks that you'd like to make or, um, asks of our committee of what we can do to support you. I know we've got a lot more forward thinking work that will need to happen in the interim, but in the, in the immediate days and weeks, uh, if you could give us a sense of anything we can do, certainly um, we're all ears. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And I, like I said at the beginning, I really appreciate the attention that you're bringing um, to this because when you bring this to the attention of your colleagues, it has a, a statewide and a state reaching effect. and you know, our approach um, with education since day one of this crisis is to, you know, all hands on deck, pull out all the stops, message this thing across the state. And so what you're doing now is is very helpful. And I know there are a lot of people that are that are tuning in here today to get um, up to speed on what's going on with this thing. Um, you know, we've talked about almost everything else I had on my list through your questions, so that's good. Um, you know, we've talked about the funding and at this point in time, I think um, making this an interim study topic, as well as any help you can give to the governor's office with uh, emergency funding and the efforts you and, and the, your co-chairwoman have already um, implemented yesterday are greatly appreciated. Beyond that, for right now, I'm not, I'm not aware of any. You know, we are continuing to work really hard with the uh, education part of this. Don't dump your fish tanks down the toilet. Don't dump them in the creek in the backyard and with some very good instructions on how they should do that. And I know that message is getting out there. A lot of our partner organizations have helped with that. And, and I certainly appreciate that. You know, going forward, I think, um, yes. Interrupt you real quick. That was one question I have is what outreach has been done specifically to municipalities and counties so that they're aware and what kind of resources can they provide to get the word out on the ground to their customers? Thank you, Madam Chair. So last week we did, um, I held a, an informational uh, Zoom meeting on Friday, we invited the County Commissioners Association as well as the uh, anybody from Wyoming Association of Municipalities who wanted to join. And then we followed that up with a letter advising them of what was going on as well as where they can go to get um, information they need. We do have a, a landing page on our website dedicated just to this issue where people can go and get concise, up-to-date information on exactly how to dispose of, of water from fish tanks and moss balls. And so that's been our effort at this point with those particular entities. But as this response team moves forward that the governor has formed, you know, that's a, certainly a key partner and a, and a key audience for outreach um, to make sure that we're working with them and answer their questions and help them 
um, identify what they can do to help as well. I will say, and I don't think I'd mentioned this yet, there are other federal partners that we've reached out to. Director Westby's talked with Bureau of Reclamation. They certainly have a stake in this and an opportunity to provide funding. I've reached out to USDA Forest Service, and, um, and they've certainly indicated that when, as far as messaging goes, that you know they have significant bodies of water in our state. They, um, they manage Flaming Gorge, the, the land around Flaming Gorge. And so anyway, the, the Forest Service has also agreed to help in any way they can. They're just waiting for us to give them uh, an ask. And so, um, you know, through different questions, like I said, I don't want to, um, I don't want to repeat what's already been said. There have been multiple actions that have already been taken to this point. And I think we've hit on, on all of them through, uh, through the course of this hearing. Oh, um, Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, do you have the ability to take private donation toward this effort? without statutory change. Director Nesbeck. Madam Chair, I, I'm gonna say I believe we can. We, we take donations for um, specified purposes um, all the time. We have donations to our Access Yes program. We have donations to specific wildlife habitat projects. So I believe the answer is yes, um, but I will confirm that with our CFO. Great, any other comments from committee members? Um, I have one final ask, Director Nesvik. I, I know that your agency put out some really helpful infographic things that people can share on social media. Um, if you want to share those JPEG or whatever um, images with committee members, I'm happy to forward them along and see if we can make it easy if, if members so choose on their personal or political um, social pages want to share that information. And along those lines, committee members, if you see articles um, circulating, talking about the critical um, importance of this issue, you know, certainly I think that's something we can do to help get the word out. Um, but that's obviously all very voluntary. So with that committee members, I think, oh, we have one more question from Mr. Haroldson or comment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Wondering if I could have a privilege of the floor. Sure. Okay, um, I'm a pastor. And so, you know, can we pray? We've got an invasive species that's on the doorstep of this state. And I think we can do some amazing things. And so if you guys wouldn't mind, I'm just gonna ask God to protect the state, protect our industry, our waterways. And we're gonna put it in his hands cause he's got way more control over a zebra muscle than we do. So God, we come right now and we thank you for this great state. God, we are so privileged to be a part of it, to be a part of the, uh, the direction of it, the protection of it. God, you've given us um, dominion over this world that you've placed us in. But God, with that comes a huge amount of responsibility. And so, God, I just pray that you would give uh, wisdom, divine wisdom to every person involved in this situation. And God, we just pray you would protect this state from this invasive species. God, we, we've seen the economic impact. We've seen uh, the physical impact, what it would mean for industries, our 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 agriculture, to our energy industry, to our sportsmen, all of us, God, every person in the state will be affected in some way, shape, or form if this uh, spreads throughout the state. So God, I just pray, uh, number one, that the contamination would not have happened. That, uh, And if it has happened, God, I pray that this the larva stage of this zebra mussel will die and that we will be able to look back on this and say we were truly protected and uh, you truly took care of us. And so God, we just come and we don't take this lightly. We'll do everything in our power and act like it depends on us. And we'll believe like it depends on you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus name, amen. Alrighty, gentlemen, thank you for being with us on the 